The book of Hebrews describes a multitude of angels in heaven that are too great to count. Hebrews 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Other Bible translations use terms like innumerable, ESV, myriads, CSB, and thousands upon thousands, NIV, to quantify this enormous throng of angels. The impressive picture expands in the book of Revelation. Then I looked, and I heard the vision of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. Revelation 5 verse 11. Other Bible versions use myriads of myriads, ESV, and even millions, NLT, here to express how many angels there are in heaven. Angels are classified in several ways in the Bible. The cherubim and seraphim, for example, are described as winged angels. Cherubim. God created the cherubim, a group of celestial beings. They are the first members of the angelic hierarchy to appear in the Bible, following Adam and Eve's fall from grace. Genesis 3 describes what happened in the Garden of Eden. After breaking God's commandment not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve were likely to reach out their hands and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. As a result, they were compelled to depart from their earthly paradise. But what would have stopped Adam from returning to the garden and disobeying God once more? This verse contains the answer. Genesis 3 verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way, to guard the way to the tree of life. We don't know Adam's reaction to witnessing those glorious cherubim for the first time in human history. Perhaps awe, fright, and wonder are all emotions that come to mind. Surprisingly, the next appearance of the cherubim in the Bible involves recovering what has been lost. Moses Moses was given specific and detailed instructions on how to make several articles that would be used in the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, where God promised to meet and commune with Moses, were the first to be detailed. What did God intend to place above or on top of the mercy seat? He went with gold cherubim representations. God's intriguing description of Moses is as follows. Exodus 5 verses 10 through 23, NKJV. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold, Inside and out you shall overlay it, and shall make it on a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried to them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends, of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim, at the two ends of it, of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. You shall also make a table of acacia wood, two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. What an awesome sight that must have been, the cherubim associated with the very presence of God. From those two sources in the Bible, it appears as though the cherubim's major responsibility may be to declare man's sinfulness and protect the presence of God from sinful men. As much as Adam yearned to return to the Garden of Eden, the cherubim reminded him that he had broken God's law. The high priest of Israel would be allowed into the Holy of Holies once a year to gaze upon the mercy seat. I'm sure he must have felt on each occasion I don't belong here in the holy presence of God, for I am a sinner. Cherubim are real and powerful beings. However, 
The cherubim in the Bible were often representative of heavenly things. In Ezekiel 10, the cherubim are depicted as having not only wings and hands, but also being full of eyes and encircled by wheels within wheels. Ezekiel 10 verses 8 through 14. All the cherubim had what looked like human hands under their wings. I looked, and each of the four cherubim had a wheel beside him, and the wheels sparkled like beryl. All four wheels looked alike and were made the same. Each wheel had a second wheel turning crosswise within it. The cherubim could move in any of the four directions they faced without turning as they moved. They went straight in the direction they faced, never turning aside. Both the cherubim and the wheels were covered with eyes. The cherubim had eyes all over their bodies, including their hands, their backs, and their wings. I heard someone refer to the wheels as the whirling wheels. Each of the four cherubim had four faces. The first was the face of an ox. The second was a human face. The third was the face of a lion. And the fourth was the face of an eagle. The prophet describes his vision, which foretells the destruction of Jerusalem. In Ezekiel 9 verse 3, the Lord descends from his throne above the cherubim to the temple's threshold, and in Ezekiel 10 verse 1, he returns to his throne above them. The cherubim are stationed on the south side of the sanctuary in the calm before the storm. They witness the beginning of the gradual withdrawal of God's glory from Jerusalem because they are stationed in a position facing the city. The fluttering of their wings foreshadows extremely significant events to come. The cherubim then rise in preparation for the departure. While Ezekiel 10 is difficult to understand, one point stands out. Cherubim are associated with God's radiance. This chapter, which involves angelic beings, is one of the Bible's most cryptic and yet evocative passages about God's grandeur. They constantly glorify God. The Morning Star The book of Isaiah 14 introduces us to a being known as Lucifer. Lucifer literally means the one who delivers light in Latin. The word is translated as dawn star in Hebrew. He was the cherub who covered the place where God's presence was manifested. He was in charge of the music. He was a talented artist. He has a lot of experience. After that, he rebelled and fell. Lucifer, however, committed a major error at some time. Ezekiel 28 verses 14 through 16. You were the anointed cherub who covers and protects, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire, sparkling jewels. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until righteousness and evil were found in you. Through the abundance of your commerce, you were internally filled with lawlessness and violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you out as a profane and unholy thing from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. The reason for Lucifer's rebellion is revealed. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Isaiah 14 verse 12. Seraphim. The seraphim are another group of angels who have been specifically identified. Seraphim is a Hebrew word that means burning ones. The seraphim are mentioned in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah lived in Jerusalem during the latter half of Israel's kingdom period and spoke on God's behalf to the leaders of Jerusalem and Judah. He delivered a message of God's judgment first and foremost. He warned Israel's corrupt leaders that their rebellion against their covenant with God would cost them dearly, that God would use the great empires of Assyria and, later, Babylon to judge Jerusalem if they continued in idolatry and tyranny of the poor. But that declaration was accompanied by a message of hope. Isaiah's grand vision of God sitting on his throne in the temple, surrounded by heavenly creatures shouting, God is holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah suddenly recognizes how corrupt he and his people Israel are, and he thinks God's holiness will destroy him, but he isn't. Then one of the seraphim flies over and burns him, not to destroy him, but to cleanse him of his sin. As Isaiah mulls over this strange experience, God assigns him a difficult task. He is to continue preaching the coming judgment. But because, but because Israel has passed the point of no return, his warnings will paradoxically harden the people. Isaiah 6, verses 1-8 through 8. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the master sitting on a throne, high, exalted. In the train of his robes filled the temple. Angel seraphs hovered above him, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two their feet, and with two they flew. 
And they called back and forth one to the other, Holy, holy, holy is God of the angel armies. His bright glory fills the whole earth. The foundations trembled at the sound of the angel voices, and then the whole house filled with smoke. I said, Doom, it's doomsday. I'm as good as dead. Every word I've ever spoken is tainted, blasphemous even. And the people I live with talk the same way, using words that corrupt and desecrate. And here I've looked God in the face, the King, God of the angel armies. Then one of the angel seraphs flew to me. He held a live coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with the coal and said, Look, this coal has touched your lips, gone your guilt, your sins wiped out. And then I heard the voice of the master. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? I spoke up. I'll go. Send me. The prophet perceived at once that he had no right to be in the holy presence of God, and he confessed as much. So one of the seraphim took a burning coal from the altar and touched Isaiah's lips to cleanse his iniquity and purge his sin. Despite belonging to different hierarchies and being shrouded in mystery in the Bible, the seraphim and cherubim share one trait. They never stop praising God. Angels and celestial beings are lovely, but they pale in contrast to our heavenly Lamb, the Lord of glory, before whom all forces in heaven and on earth bow in holy devotion and breathless adoration. Psalms 80 verse 1 Please listen, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph's descendants like a flock. O God, enthroned above the cherubim, display your radiant glory. Psalms 99 verse 1 NKJV The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. We can assume there were several seraphim because Isaiah mentions each one and one cried unto another. The seraphim's job in heaven is to sing praises to God's name and character. Angels perform different tasks in the Bible. Some angels are God's messengers. Daniel 4 verse 13. Other angels are servants of God. Watcher angels are mentioned in the book of Daniel. Daniel 4 verse 13. Angels are often described as military hosts of the celestial armies. Jeremiah 5 verse 14. Therefore, this is what the Lord God Almighty says. Because the people have spoken these words, I will make my words in your mouth of fire, and these people the wood it consumes. Other times, angels are called sons of the mighty, Psalm 89 verse 6, or sons of God, Job 2 verse 1. Only three angels are identified by name in the Bible. Gabriel, Daniel 8 verse 16, Michael the archangel, Daniel 10 verse 13, and Lucifer, the fallen angel, Isaiah 14 verse 12. Gabriel. Gabriel is one of the most well-known biblical angels. In Hebrew, Gabriel means God's hero, the mighty one, or God is great. In the Bible, he is commonly referred to as Jehovah's messenger or the Lord's messenger. Contrary to popular belief, the Bible never refers to him as an archangel. Ministry of Gabriel Gabriel is essentially God's merciful and promising messenger. He appears in the Bible four times, each time bringing good news. However, Gabriel's disclosures are crucial in the unfolding of God's plans, purposes, and verdicts. Daniel We see Gabriel for the first time in the Bible in Daniel 8 verse 15 through 16. There, he delivers God's vision for the end time. God has entrusted him with relaying a message from heaven's situation room that reveals God's plan for history. Daniel 8, verse 15 through 16. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. In verse 17, Gabriel says, as he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. Gabriel, sketching panoramically the procession of earthly kingdoms, assured Daniel that history would culminate in the return of Christ, the Prince of Princes. Daniel 8 verse 25, AMP, and conqueror of the King of Fierce Countenance. Daniel 8 verse 23, AMP. Zacharias telling of his prophet. Gabriel makes his first appearance in the New Testament in Luke 1. Because God commanded a prophet to go before the Messiah, 
both to proclaim his coming and to prepare the hearts and minds of the people for him. The account of angelic involvement in Christ's life must begin before we even consider Mary and Joseph. In his wisdom and sovereignty, God decided that the birth of this prophet should be a miracle in and of itself. Zacharias was in the temple waiting for the Lord. Suddenly, there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Luke 1 verse 11. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw the angel, he was troubled and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, because your petition in prayer was heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have great joy and delight, and many will rejoice over his birth, for he will be great and distinguished in the sight of the Lord, and he will never drink wine or liquor, and he will be filled with and empowered to act by the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back from sin to love and serve the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children in the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, which is to seek and submit to the will of God in order to make ready a people perfectly prepared spiritually and morally for the Lord. And Zacharias said to the angel, How will I be certain of this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in age. The angel replied and said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand and minister in the very presence of God. And I have been sent by him to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Listen carefully. You will be continually silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe what I told you. But my words will be fulfilled at their proper time. The people outside in the court were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering about his long delay in the temple. But when he did come out, he was unable to speak to them. They realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. When his time of priestly service was finished, he returned to his home. Now after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months she secluded herself completely saying, this is how the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor on me to take away my disgrace among men. Now in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Luke 1 verses 11 through 26. Zacharias, a priest, and his wife, Elizabeth, were chosen as the prophet's parents. They had never had children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were now past the childbearing years as well. Luke 1 verse 7. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Take note of how closely this account parallels the case of Abraham and Sarah in Genesis. Genesis 18, verse 11 through 12. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in years. She was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself when she heard the Lord's words saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure and delight, my Lord, husband, being also old. But as previously stated, God sent the angel Gabriel to Zacharias to inform him that he and Elizabeth were expecting a child and that this child would be the Messiah's forerunner, John the Baptist. When John the Baptist and Jesus were older, he did indeed prepare the people for Christ by pointing out their sins and calling for repentance. When Christ was ready to begin his public ministry and John's task was finished, John said to Christ, John 3 verses 28 through 30, You yourselves are my witnesses that I stated. I am not the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed, but I have only been sent ahead of him as his appointed forerunner and messenger to announce and proclaim his coming. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, who stands by and listens to him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this pleasure and joy of mine is now complete. He must increase in prominence, but I must decrease. Mary, whatever epic tasks Gabriel had previously completed for the Lord, this one had to be the most epic of them all. He was dispatched to Nazareth, a Galilean town, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Mary was the name of the virgin. What a lovely message Gabriel had for that young lady. Luke 1 verse 31 through 32. Listen carefully. You will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and eminent and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. 
This particular angel was bestowed with such great honor and responsibility by God. Because Christ's birth was to be a one-of-a-kind event, a new life generated outside of the regular human process, in a virgin, without a man, angelic involvement in his life began long before he was born. Certainly, the lady who was to bear the Christ child needed to be informed ahead of time. She needed to be prepared for an event that would have been impossible without God's assistance. Furthermore, even if the occurrence was a work of the Holy Spirit, the young woman would be mocked and abused by those in her family and community who did not believe in the miraculous nature of the conception. Indeed, under Mosaic law, fornification, which would be the only normal way for an unmarried woman to become pregnant, was punishable by death. Leviticus 20 verse 10 If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. Mary said to the angel, How will this be? since I am a virgin and have no intimacy with any man. Then the angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you like a cloud. For that reason, the holy, pure, sinless child shall be called the Son of God. And listen, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. For with God, nothing is or ever shall be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel left her. Luke 1, verses 26 through 38. Mary was understandably perplexed when Gabriel broke the news to her. Gabriel, on the other hand, explained that it would be the power of God himself that would bring it about. Take note of Mary's reaction to the news. May your word to me be fulfilled. Luke 1, verse 38. When Mary was discovered to be pregnant with the Christ child, Joseph, her promised husband, wanted to hide her away to protect her from public humiliation. Certainly, Mary had told him about the pregnancy, but it was clear that he was having difficulty accepting it. So an angel was sent to reassure Joseph of Mary's miraculous divine pregnancy and to encourage him to accept her as his wife. Joseph submitted, providing yet another example of gracious obedience to God. Matthew 1 verses 18-23 now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her promised husband, being a just and righteous man, and not wanting to expose her publicly to shame, planned to send her away and divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, descendant of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus, the Lord is salvation, for he will save his people from their sins. All this happened in order to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which when translated means God with us. He proclaims, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, Israel, forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Luke 1 verse 33. This divine declaration of Gabriel will be the Magna Carta of the Incarnation in the foundation stone of the world to come throughout all time. God became flesh to redeem us. Angel Michael. Michael is probably the most well-known angelic being in the Bible, along with Gabriel. We already know Michael is an archangel, but what does that entail? What has he done? What are his responsibilities? And how does he fit into God's heavenly host? The prophet Daniel introduces us to Michael. Daniel had been fasting and praying for three weeks when the angel appeared to him on the first day. The angel, however, was thwarted by a figure known as the Prince of the Kingdom of Persia, who stood in his way for 21 days, the entire time Daniel had fasted and prayed. This was clearly a powerful demon dispatched to Persia to represent the devil's kingdom and oppose God's. In the third year of Cyrus, King of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the message was true and it referred to great conflict, warfare, misery. And he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I ate no tasty food, nor did any meat or wine enter my mouth, and I did not anoint, refresh, groom myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was on the bank of the great river Hittichel, which is the Tigris, I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, 
whose loins were girded with a belt of pure gold of Euphaz. His body also was like beryl, with a golden luster. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words was like the noise of a multitude of people or the roaring of the sea. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision of this heavenly being, for the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great panic overwhelmed them, so they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my normal appearance turned to a deathly pale, and I grew weak and faint with fright. Then I heard the sound of his words, and when I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep, with my face toward the ground. Then behold, a hand touched me and set me unsteadily on my hands and knees. So he said to me, O oh Daniel, you highly regarded and greatly beloved man, understand the words that I am about to say to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And while he was saying this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, do your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God. Your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing in opposition to me for twenty-one days. Then, behold, Michael, one of the chief of the celestial princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is in regard to the days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was speechless. And behold, one who resembled the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke and said to him who was standing before me, O my Lord, because of the vision, anguish has come upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can such a weakened servant of my Lord talk with such a being as my Lord? For now there remains no strength in me, nor has any breath been left in me. Then the one, Gabriel, whose appearance was like that of a man, touched me again, and he strengthened me. He said, O man, highly regarded and greatly beloved, do not be afraid. Peace be to you. Take courage and be strong. Now when he had spoken to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you understand fully why I came to you? Now I shall return to fight against the hostile prince of Persia, and when I have gone, behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. Daniel 10 verses 1 through 20. In Daniel 10, the prophet fasts, humbling himself before God and praying for insight into the Jewish future. After 21 days, an angel appears to him and explains the delay. The prince of Persia had been opposing him the entire time, and Michael couldn't continue his journey to Daniel until he relieved the angel. The angel stays with Daniel long enough to foretell future events for the Jews, but then he must return to fighting the prince of Persia, and the prince of Greece will soon join the fight too. In the face of these forces, only Michael stands by this angel. Because we see Michael in connection with some kind of spiritual struggle every time we see him, it might be appropriate to give him the title of general. Michael is the only one the Bible calls an archangel. Michael's title is revealed in Jude 9. The Greek word archangel, archangelos, means chief angel or chief messenger. Although the term archangel is not used in the Bible to describe him, another angel refers to him as one of the chief princes. Jude 9 verse 9 But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander but said, The Lord rebuke you. Michael is referred to as one of the chief princes in the phrase, one of the chief princes. However, if there are any other archangels, their identities are not revealed in the Bible. Michael stands guard over Israel. In Daniel's final vision, an angel describes how the Jews' final days will unfold. At this time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will appear. Daniel 12 verse 1 Now at that end time, Michael, the great angelic prince who stands guard over the children of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. But at that time your people, Everyone who is found written in the book of life will be rescued. The angel also refers to Michael as Daniel's prince. Daniel 10 verse 21 But I, Gabriel, will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. There is no one who stands firmly with me and strengthens himself against these hostile spirit forces except Michael, your prince, the guardian of your nation. The Bible doesn't say what standing guard entails, 
but it's very clear that Michael has special responsibilities for Israel. In his role as a fighter, Michael has a particular responsibility to Israel. In Daniel 10 verse 21 and 12 verse 1, he is said to be the prince of that nation. As we read ancient and modern history, I believe we see the hand of Michael defending Israel. Michael directly opposes Satan. In addition to the Old Testament references, Michael is mentioned in the New Testament as well. The ninth version of the Little Book of Jude specifically refers to Michael as an archangel and recounts his battle with Lucifer over Moses' body. Michael triumphed thanks to the Lord's assistance. According to Jude, Michael did not have the audacity to pronounce a railing judgment. The Greek word for railing is often translated blasphemous or defaming against the devil. What he does say is interesting enough to merit its own fact. Michael only says four words in the Bible. In other words, three Greek words that are frequently translated into four English words. In Jude 9, Michael rebukes Satan saying, the Lord rebuke you. Michael is a military commander of some angels. In John's apocalypse, he sees a great war in heaven. He sees a great battle in heaven between Michael and his angels and the dragon Satan and his angels. However, the devil and his forces are too weak to remain in heaven, so they are all cast down to earth. Revelation 12 verses 7 through 11. And war broke out in heaven, Michael the archangel and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, but they were not strong enough and did not prevail. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the age-old serpent who is called the devil and Satan. He who continually deceives and seduces the entire inhabited world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom, dominion, reign of our God, and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our believing brothers and sisters has been thrown down at last. He who accuses them and keeps bringing charges of sinful behavior against them before our God day and night. And they overcame and conquered him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. For they did not love their life and renounce their faith even when faced with death. Michael, the archangel, will shout as he accompanies Jesus at his second coming. Not only does he proclaim the matchless and exciting news that Jesus Christ returns, but he speaks the word of life to all who are dead in Christ and who await the resurrection. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 To protect Israel, the archangel Michael and his fellow angels will fight against the dragon and his demons. The angel's method of warfare will be similar to what they do on behalf of all believers today. Hebrews 1 verse 14 Are not all the angels ministering spirits sent out by God to serve, accompany, protect those who will inherit salvation? Of course they are. As Michael fought on Daniel's behalf against demons in the Old Testament era, angels fight for believers every day and will fight for Israel in the tribulation to come. Daniel 10 verse 13 But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing in opposition to me for 21 days. Then, behold, Michael, one of the chief of the celestial princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Despite the devil's fury, he and his demons will not triumph. Indeed, they have no place in heaven any longer. They will not, in the end, thwart God's plan for Israel or the return of his son. Yet angelic beings are mentioned at least 273 times in 34 books of the Bible. While we don't know exactly how many angels there are, we do know from scripture that an exceedingly large number of angels exist. A few passages of scripture describe angels as stars. While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? Daniel 8 verse 10. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. Judges 5 verse 20. From the heavens the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The idea of stars may give us our best clue as to how many angels there are. If angels are like the stars in heaven, they are too many to count. Moses says in Deuteronomy 33 verse 2 that the Lord came to speak to him from Sinai with myriads of holy ones or angels. How many are myriads? The primary definition of myriad as an adjective is innumerable or countless. Psalm 68 verse 17 says the angels of God remember tens of thousands, thousands and thousands, CSB. Clearly, 
the writer has trouble even coming close to estimating the number of angels in existence. But as wonderful as angelic and heavenly beings are, they pale in comparison to our heavenly Lamb, the Lord of glory, before whom all powers in heaven and on earth bow in holy worship and breathless adoration. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned above the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant, shine forth. Psalm 80 verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble with submissive wonder. He sits enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Psalm 99 verse 1. God's glory will not be denied, and every heavenly being gives silent or vocal testimony to the splendor of God. In the tabernacle in the wilderness, designs representing the guardian cherubim formed a part of the mercy seat and were made of gold. You shall make two cherubim, winged angelic figures, of solid hammered gold at the two ends of the mercy seat. Exodus 25 verse 18. God will always protect his people. To watch the story of Esther, click here. Click here. Click here.